I'm Chris Islip, the Executive Director at the Montana World Affairs Council, and I'd like to welcome you to our event tonight. I have a number of uh, very interesting and eloquent remarks here that I'm not going to give, so we can go <laughs> straight, to our, uh, straight to our event, but before I do that very quickly, um, for those of you who don't know the Montana World Affairs Council, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit that engages Montana's communities and schools to foster awareness and understanding in global issues. We've been working in this state for 22 years. We've been here in Bozeman many times in your schools, and we're very grateful that you could come and join us tonight. I'd like to briefly thank our very generous donors, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance and Stockman Bank, who help us bring programs like this and so many more to your community, your schools, and to this great state. So I'm gonna skip over my remarks. I would like to introduce tonight's very distinguished speakers. To my immediate right is Governor Mark Rasko. Governor Rasko served as Montana's governor from 1993 to 2001. His roots run deep in Montana's colorful history. His ancestors came to the Montana territory in 1860s Mark's grandfather lived in Libby, or he arrived in Libby rather, in 1917 to work as a logging camp cook in northwestern Montana. Mark grew up in Miles City, then in Libby. While studying at Carroll College in Helena, Mark worked summers for the highway department, mapping county roads and railroad crossings across the state. This gave Mark his first opportunity to see Montana corner to corner and to meet many individuals who remain good friends. As an Army ROTC graduate, Mark was immediately assigned to the Judge Advocate General Corps and stationed in West Germany, where he served as Chief Prosecutor for the largest US military jurisdiction in Europe. While there, he also managed to teach business and criminal law for the University of Maryland. Mark has served as a State Assistant Attorney General, as well as Montana's first Special Prosecutor, and was elected governor in 1992 and 96. As governor, Mark sought to improve government efficiency and bring government services closer to its owners, the people. He favored reducing government wherever possible and eliminated two executive departments. Following his service to the state, Mark served as the chairman of the Republican National Committee and Governor Rasko has continued his distinguished public service, most recently promoting civil dialogues and community events like this one. General Wesley Clark, is a businessman, educator, writer, and commentator. He serves as chairman and CEO of Wesley K. Clark & Associates, a strategic consulting firm, chairman and founder of Envera Incorporated, a licensed investment bank, chairman of Energy Security Partners, LLC, as well as numerous corporate boards. He's active in energy, including oil and gas, biofuels, electric power, and batteries, finance, and security. During his business career, he served as an advisory, consultant or board member of over 90 private and publicly traded companies. In the not-for-profit space, he's a senior fellow at UCLA's Berkel Center for International Relations, director of the Atlantic Council, and founding chair of City Year Little Rock, North Little Rock. General Clark founded Renew America Together in 2019. A best-selling author, General Clark has written four books and is a frequent contributor on TV and newspapers. General Clark retired as a four-star general after 38 years in the United States Army, having served in his last assignment as commander of U.S. Southern Command Europe. Uh, sorry, as U.S. Southern Command, and then as commander of U.S. European Command, Supreme Allied Commander Europe. He graduated first in his class at West Point and completed degrees in philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. While serving in Vietnam, he commanded an infantry company in combat where he was severely wounded and evacuated home on a stretcher. He later commanded at the battalion brigade and division levels and served in a number of significant staff positions, including service as the director of strategic plans and policy. He was the principal author of both the U.S. National Military Strategy and Joint Vision 2010, prescribing U.S. war fighting for full spectrum dominance. He also worked with Ambassador Richard Holbrook in the Dayton peace process, where he helped write and negotiate significant portions of the 1995 Dayton Peace Agreement. 
In his final assignment as Supreme Allied Commander, Europe, he led NATO forces to victory in Operation Allied Force, a 78-day air campaign, backed by ground invasion planning and a diplomatic process, saving 1.5 million Albanians from ethnic cleansing. His awards include the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Defense Distinguished Service Medal, Silver Star, Bronze Star, Purple Heart, honorary knighthoods from the British and Dutch governments, and numerous other awards from governments, including the award of Commander of the Legion of Honor from France. He's also been awarded the Department of State Distinguished Service Award and numerous honorary doctorates and civilian honors. Could you please join me in welcoming Governor Mark Rasco and General Wesley Clark. Well, I'm delighted to be here with you, Governor, and thank you for that fine introduction of both of us. And it's exciting to be up here in Bozeman. It's a beautiful place. Those mountains were spectacular when I landed. And um, when you travel across the country from Arkansas, I was in Phoenix this morning, and, um, and up here you realize what a great country this is. You meet so many wonderful people, and, uh, and yet what a challenging time it is for America. And um, that's what we're here to talk about uh, this evening. I wanna thank all of you for being here. I apologize for being late uh, on behalf of Southwest Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I hope we're gonna have a good discussion about America, the world, and how we pull all this together at this incredibly important, significant moment in American and world history. Thank you. Well, General, um, let me publicly, even though I've privately welcomed you to Montana. Welcome you uh, to our great state and to tell you how humbled I am to be on the same stage with you and especially talking about a topic that is so relevant and keen and important at the uh, present moment. Um, as I have, of course, everyone in America has watched uh, the events unfolding in Ukraine, we, uh, witnessing people fighting um, with everything they've got for freedom and independence and a democratic way of life and the um, staggering and almost breathless uh, violence that takes place on a daily basis and knowing that you were on the cutting edge and present and accounted for in those same or similar circumstances uh, throughout the course of your service. Let me also um, thank you for your service to our country, uh, to the world and to this community tonight to uh, talk about a topic that is uh, critically important uh, to all of us. One of the things that um, I was, um, that was mentioned to me uh, would be appropriate to talk about this evening was what is happening with our democracy in America. And uh, you mentioned earlier on that um, it is a very urgent and incredibly important um, issue that confronts us uh, all across the, the United States of America and your central effort to focus upon civil dialogue. Uh, clearly, I think have top my list of urgent matters to be addressed. So I'm grateful for your efforts and uh, your sincere dedication to making certain that takes place. Well, thanks very much. So we get to talk now? Can we just- I think that's- we're going uh, back and forth, right? You're, you're so the, the idea is- You're the Supreme about, Allied Commander. Well, but. <laughs> no, we're gonna talk for a couple of minutes. You're the governor. <laughs> we're gonna talk for a few minutes and then we're gonna ask you all to join in and ask us some questions. So, um, so I started this program called Renew America Together and to try to bring former Democrats and former Republicans together to talk publicly about politics, and about life in America now. Um, he, uh, Mark, you're, an, you're a successful candidate and office holder. I was just a candidate, but I did win Oklahoma in my <laughs> presidential campaign. I was pretty happy with that. But um, the idea was that, you know, when people are no longer asking for votes or asking for money, they can be more candid about what the country's like. And, um, and so if you look at where we are today, we're in the way I look at it is we're in the third major cycle of American history since the Civil War. First, we had the Gilded Age, and, uh, and that was the age of in rapid industrialization in America. A lot of investments and, um, and a lot of immigration came in. 
and it was about iron and steel and mining coal and um, and the settling of the uh, upper Midwest. And um, it, it was the start really of labor movements in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and Wall Street was in charge of the economy. And uh, down in places like Texas, farmers couldn't buy what they needed. Ranchers couldn't get it because they didn't have There was a movement for, to, to, to base the US currency not just on gold, but on silver. And and uh, anyway, the wealth built up and then the progressive movement started. People just got to where they just couldn't stand these, uh, the, the, the train barons and the steel barons and the Carnegies and the Mellons and, the, and, uh, and all these uh, super wealthy people. And so uh, Theodore Roosevelt started it. And uh, it was picked up then uh, by Woodrow Wilson. He stole it from the Republican Party. And then he used uh, World War I to, to bring uh, women and African Americans into the labor force in this incredible year and a half that we were in World War I. He was like a dictator, he even put in a, 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 an action against a, a law against free speech that they declared was unconstitutional. So when the war was over and he was had a stroke and so forth, and the other party came in and sort of dismantled all that stuff, we had the Depression. And Roosevelt was elected in 32, and he went back and got a whole grab bag of ideas that had been sort of half thought out. And he put in the rest of the progressive movement, including things like social security, the Securities and Exchange Commission, a lot of regulation of banks, um, raised the income tax, tried to pack the Supreme Court, didn't succeed in that. Uh, but it was a contentious time in America. And he set a standard for taking care of labor and workers that carried through the World War II period, then the Truman administration, then Eisenhower, um, then Kennedy, Johnson, <clears throat> and even Nixon. As Richard Nixon said, we're all Keynesians. I was in the Office of Management and Budget in the Ford administration. I don't know if you knew that, but I was a I was a 30-year-old Army major. I was a White House fellow working in OMB for Jim Lynn. And, um, and Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney used to throw me out of White House meetings and stuff. I was running around, you know, taking notes. And, and um, so I got to see the Ford administration up close. And most of my friends were Republicans at that point. And, um, but Reagan came in and he changed <coughs> everything. There was a whole new theory of how the economy worked. It wasn't about giving ordinary people money. It was about freeing up capital to invest and create wealth and let the private sector do things. So Eisenhower built the interstate highway system. Reagan said, let's let the ingenuity of the private sector make the decision. He said the worst words in the worst nine words in the, in the English language are, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. And so he started a whole movement that continues to this day. And it's about low taxes, what George W. said, I'm going to give your money back to you. And it's been 40 years of Reagan, Reaganism. So it's the Gilded Age, the progressive movement, and the age of Reagan. And I think we're getting near the end of it because you can see on the left side of the political spectrum all these young people like Alexandra Ocasio Cortez and, and the quartet in Congress. And, the, you know, they're, they're pretty radical on the left. And that's an indication that they're getting support because people see things. Democracy is self-correcting, or at least it always has been. And so we go through these cycles. So you can't get too, too disturbed about them, but this one seems different because people are so like polarized, you know? And um, people are telling me, they, they, you know, you can't talk at the dinner table uh, at Thanksgiving because you don't know whether your relatives are Republicans and support Donald Trump or not. And, People were pretty upset about it. So that's the perspective I have. And the question is then, Governor, how do we bring this country together so we can get the best ideas from both parties and take the country forward in a way that it's unified? And so when we look overseas and people like China and Russia look at us, they don't think we're about to fall apart. They think America's a bastion of 
strong democracy, we should listen to America, not tear it down. But, you know, how do we do that in a democratic system? Well, I do think that um, the issue you describe is the um, existential question of our times. And uh, frankly, when I try to search for answers, I tend to think about how it all started. And of course, uh, when the uh, Puritans hit the shores of, um, of the Eastern United States coastline all those years ago, it was 180 years that they spent then experimenting essentially with different forms of government and didn't find any of them to be acceptable or yeah. efficient. And we ended up in situations where the colonies uh, bonded and came together and passed the Articles of Confederation, which was essentially a, a uh, treaty that um, guaranteed friendship, but they couldn't pay their troops during the Revolutionary War. They had their own currency that was banned from leaving the uh, exterior boundaries, for instance, of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. New Jersey had its own Navy. There was no way to pay our troops. So they uh, realized this wasn't working. And when I look at what happened in the summer of 1787 with the Constitutional Convention, which, as everybody knows, I'm sure, wasn't called to craft a constitution. It was called to amend the Articles of Confederation. But nonetheless, yeah. 117 days later, they came forward with a document that has stood the test of time. And what I have learned, because I have been, like you, fearful of what's going on in our country, so much turmoil and tumult every single day, it seems a lot of bitterness and anger um, and inability to be able to focus upon policy questions that impact all of America and to make some movement forward. I realized that in the beginning, those people came with very strong feelings. Uh, they had their own perspectives based upon where they came from, which individual colony. But over the course of those 117 days, they were able to come together in a spirit of compromise. And I think even some of the reasons for explanation had to do with how they conducted their affairs. They decided, first of all, that um, there was not going to be any press presence, which was a salutary contribution to the deliberations. Secondly, they had rules of procedure. They uh, could speak once, and they had to speak to the chair. Um, and thirdly, they would take uh, test votes, but they never would disclose them because they didn't want people to become irretrievably committed to a position that they couldn't later re-examine. And I think really when they got down to what kind of government they wanted to have, they focused upon some of those people, as you mentioned, during the Enlightened Age that had been political philosophers and offered thoughts. Um, and one of them, of course, um, influenced Jefferson very, very substantially. But they essentially focused upon things like virtue and fidelity. And then they crafted, they decided what they wanted in terms of liberty and virtue and values. Then they crafted their government. And that's how we ended up with a tripartite form of government based upon uh, good manners, patience, thoughtfulness, care and taking uh, care of each other and convincing the public generally about how to proceed. So I tend to think that what we have gotten away from in this country is everything from um, good manners uh, to trusting each other and not even being able to listen to each other, talk to each other, um, respect each other's ideas, um, to have some discipline in our discourse and in our relationships. And then institutionally, I think there are some things that have happened that um, are providing incentives for us to get further and further apart. And the final um, ingredient, I think, that places us in this uh, particular spot at the moment is that we have all thought that democracy would just survive, as you mentioned, and that it was incredibly durable. It would take care of itself without any of us being involved in tending uh, to the garden of democracy, when in reality, it's very, very fragile. It depends upon virtually all of us. And it um, certainly is not being aided and abetted in its ultimate purpose by the internet. And that has made things even more rigid, brittle, angry, 
and uh, difficult um, to deal with. So it's a combination of circumstance, a failure to remember, um, and a commitment of se by self-discipline as citizens to making certain that we conduct our affairs that um, reflect um, manners and, um, and respect for each other and fidelity to the Constitution above all else. Yeah, well, that, that those are really important thoughts and, uh, and having the focus on values and virtue, civic virtue, is really the critical foundation of democracy. It's really about respect for each other's opinions and giving people the, um, the space to have differences because people have different interests. And it's what, um, it's what Madison and Hamilton wrote in Federalist 51. They said, uh, if men were angels, there'd be no need for government. But as they aren't, you have to set up a system in which interest counteracts interest and ambition counteracts ambition. <clears throat> so there's always been an element of conflict in this country and um, in the politics of it. And sometimes it gets out of hand. You know, if you read the history of this country before the Civil War in the Congress and then Senate, I mean, people were really uh, mean to each other. There was a senator from Massachusetts who was um, attacked and, and beaten into a pulp by a congressman, a young congressman from South Carolina over the issue of, essentially over the issue of slavery. And, um, and uh, there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of uh, violent incidents in the Congress before it actually broke down. And I'll tell you a war story on how this sort of got started, how I look at it, is um, when I was a young student uh, at Oxford after I graduated from West Point, <clears throat> we were reading American political theory. You probably read the same books, Governor. There was a theorist named Robert Dahl, and the title of his book was Political Theory. And the essence of it was the American political system is flawed because the parties, they don't stand for anything. The parties are just collections of people. Why? There's conservative Democrats and there's liberal Democrats and there's conservative Republicans and there's liberal Republicans and, and then there's Northern and Southern and Eastern and Western. And uh, well, the American political system would be a whole lot better if the parties were pure and stood for something like the Labor Party in Britain and the conservative or Tory party there. And um, I remember reading it and thinking, yeah, it is kind of, it's confusing. Uh, you know, you don't know really, I mean, politics is, we used to say all politics is local. And so people had to appeal to their local constituency. And if you were a congressman or senator, you were kind of judged on what you did for your congressional district or your state. Did you get new bridges? Did you get courthouse? Uh, what have you done for the people that voted for you? And I was a one star out at the National Training Center in California in 1990 and uh, Newt Gingrich came by and Newt was a firebrand young congressman and, and um, he was a Republican from Georgia and he, uh, he and I immediately identified with each other. He said, you know, he said, I grew up at Fort Benning, Georgia. He said, my stepfather was in the army. He said, and I, I teach military history at, at, at Georgia State. And he said, you know, in Congress, he said, we, we, we people in Congress, we ought to learn from you generals because, uh, you know, politics is like war. And I'm sure you've got, you know, you've got secrets for how to handle things and we should learn from you. And um, I was respectful. You know, when you're in uniform, you're always, um, you're always subordinate to civil authority. And so congressman or senator or governor, you say, yes, sir, and you're pretty nice to them. And um, so I didn't, I didn't think too much about this at the time. I thought, boy, this guy's really dynamic. He's really going places. And, um, but what I didn't understand about what he was saying is that politics really isn't like war. It shouldn't be like war. It should be groups of people trying to work together, bringing different ideas and perspectives together for the good of the community, the city, the state, the country. And um, I was at the um, inaugural in 2008 at Union Station. I listened to Joe Biden, who just come in as vice president, tell a story. And I've thought about this story a lot because um, 
he was a like a 30 30 year old senator and he'd um, he lost his wife and family and the senate majority leader had uh, sort of uh, adopted him mike mansfield and and so um one day he heard jesse helms a firebrand republican from uh north carolina on the senate floor and he went to the Mansfield and said, that guy's just, the way he talks, it's just, he's just so rabid. He shouldn't even be up here. He's just terrible. He, Mansfield said to him, said, well, what would you, what would you think if I told you that he and his wife just adopted a, a young orphan boy from, from South Korea? He said, well, yeah, I think that, that's, that's very, that's very uh, salutary very kind hearted. He said, he said, and Mansfield said to him, let me tell you something. He said, our job is not to go after each other. He said, the people in this country elect the very best people they can find to represent their district or their state, and they send them to Washington. And our job is to work together to bring out the best in each other to do the best we can for the country. And I thought that it's such an admirable way of putting it, you know, and it's such a contrast with what we're seeing today. You're, you're, you're so correct. Of course, we um, in Montana have a great admiration and affection for Senator Mansfield, yeah. who um, Ambassador Mansfield, who was a man of few words, but of, uh, a man of extraordinary character and virtue. And he was a leader. He didn't try to do all of the thinking for the group. He tried to bring out the best thinking from the group. Yeah. My guess would be, and I'd be really interested in knowing the answer to this question, that your career, of course, is absolutely incomparable in terms of the positive things that you've done, both in military service and, and outside of military service. And my guess would be that when it came time for you to consider incredibly serious issues that involve life and death of those that you commanded, and that um, those who advised you, your advisors um, trying to give you options uh, to make decisions about, that my guess would be, knowing how much this issue matters to you, and that you have experienced personally drawing out from various different factions, different thoughts, intuitions, uh, different perspectives, so that you could ultimately distill all those various suggestions and build them into either a regulation or a battle plan or a, a policy or procedure that at the end of the day could satisfy really the interests of all who were concerned because you invested the time, you invested your confidence in your subordinates, you encouraged them to be honest um, and to be careful uh, with, with one another. I'd be really interested to know if that isn't something that's really something very familiar to you throughout the course of your leadership career. Yeah, you try to play, not to play people off against one another. Yes. You try not to show favorites. You try to bring the best out. They always say, you know, when you're working with people, you can't, when, when you, everybody has good points and bad points. You can't correct people's bad points. They can't, if they would correct them themselves, if they could. But, but what you have to do is you have to bring out their good points and strengthen what they do right and use that to make a team. And the other thing I learned along the way is something a retired general taught me. He said, there'll always be some great stars in your units. There'll always be outstanding people. He said, but if you can take your worst unit and make it average, you'll have a great command. And so you have to work and bring everybody up. And that's the way I kind of approach politics is I, um, and I joked when I was running for president that I was kind of a socialist, but I didn't think anybody would take it seriously. I mean, I'm not a socialist, but I, I did live, I worked for the government for a long time, you know, longer than you did. And I, and I lived in government housing and my son went to a government school and um, I had government medical care and, um, and it was on a government owned installation. I mean, if that's not socialism, what is? but it was the United States Army. And when I got out into the private sector, back in Little Rock, I looked at people who were going bankrupt because 
they'd had an automobile accident. They couldn't afford to pay their automobile bills. And I looked at people that didn't have access to a lawyer. And I realized, you know, that the concept of American democracy that I had presented when I was traveling around Latin America and in Europe, it's, it's, this is a pretty tough, hard place. It's not a socialist state. It's an anti-socialist state, really. I mean, in America, you sink or swim. And it amazed me, and it still does. So many immigrants aspire to come to this country. They think the streets are paved with gold. But you've got to make your own gold in America. We're, we're, we're pretty tough, and we're hard on each other. And maybe that's what makes us what it is. But we're not Europe. We're not socialists in this country. This is a conservative country. But somehow, we have to find more common ground so that, you know, it's, it's like we haven't raised the taxes on highways on the, uh, in the federal highway state uh, fund with gasoline tax since 1992. I mean, how can that be? Now, I guess, you know, I don't know, Montana and Arkansas are probably alike. We probably have more miles of road per capita than any other state. And so getting those roads paved and we're putting the shoulders on and keeping them painted, that's a big deal in, the, in our states. And we could use that help from the federal government. We don't get that much of it, and not enough. And so I just, you know, I look at the country, I think, how can we, how can we bring it together more? And I have three things to think about. Number one is I would like to find a way to take some of the money out of politics. Now, I raised $23 million when I ran for office. And I was only in the race for five months. And um, it broke my heart to see a lot of people giving me $2,000 when they couldn't afford to do it. But um, now that it's, it's up to $2,800 per person. And there's these political action committees and there's contributors that you don't even know who they are. And the last presidential race cost what? two billion or five billion dollars or something like this. And most of it goes to television and television advertisements. I just, that it, it, it's, my wife worked for Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison and she's a Republican, she was a Republican from Texas. And, and Kay would spend like 30% of her time calling constituents and asking for money. And that's that, that just not, it shouldn't be like that. That's one thing. Second thing is, I do believe we have to talk more in this country about what's good for each other. We had an idea for a while that if everybody do, did what was best for himself or herself, then that would be the best for the country. But it actually, it isn't. When we started, you know, airlines, we said, well, uh, you know, we're going to support them. They got to do good for the country. When we started radio broadcasting, we said the airwaves belong to the country and you've got to have certain standards for the use of the airwaves. We regulated utilities because they were for the common good. And that idea of the common good that's in the Constitution is it, it just sort of disappeared. And in my part of the country, especially down in places like Texas, Barbed wire is a real important thing. And you always get the impression that, you know, it's like, I got mine, stay off my land. And that's okay if you're a farmer and you don't want people stepping on your corn or you're a rancher, or you got your cattle grazing. But as a philosophy for a country, we have to work together. So I, I, that's my second thing. And my third thing is, I just don't know what we're going to do with uh, social media and the, the sort of lies and so forth that come in. A friend of mine was telling me, he said, look, you have to understand everybody in the world interferes in your presidential election. This is like, really? They do? I mean, yeah, I mean, I knew when I was running, people in Panama said, oh, General Clark, because I'd lived in Panama, they said, you're our favorite candidate. You know, but I didn't think anything about it. And, 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 you know, in the 2016 campaign, 
Russia, Israel, Saudi Arabia, all decided they did not want Hillary Clinton to be president. And say, well, why do they have a vote? They don't really have a vote. But if you think what the president does, well, Joe Biden can't do that much about inflation. He can't tell the oil companies that they got to not take a profit off the price of gasoline. He can't tell the banks that they can't raise the interest rate. He's, he can appoint the Federal Reserve chairman, but he doesn't even have that much control over the Fed. But what he can control is foreign policy. And this is what everybody in the world knows, but American elections are about domestic policy. This is all the headlines, you know, today. Inflation, big problem for President Biden. And yet, if you look around the world, the issue is not about inflation in the United States. It's about the war in Ukraine. And it's about possible Putin use of nuclear weapons. And it's about China maybe invading Taiwan. It's such a dichotomy. And those foreign interests converge on the United States through money and through social media. Well, I, I think you're in absolutely correct about campaign finance, um, which was the first um, um, issue you mentioned. And uh, frankly, it's obscene, the amount of money that is spent uh, in this country. I think during the last cycle, the latest figures that I can remember seeing were uh, in excess of $15 billion spent on political campaigns all across the country. And even here in Montana, there was um, $350 million spent on state races and the uh, two, the one congressional race and two Senate, uh, one Senate race, $160 million just on the Senate race alone. And um, having been involved at a different time in trying to raise funds through everything from bake sales um, to art shows to door to door uh, recruitment and raising um, in the neighborhood of about $1 million when I ran for the very first time. Um, and then witnessing that $25 million was spent in Montana during the last gubernatorial campaign. In a matter of just 20 years, we have seen it um, increase, you know, 25 times over what it was in the beginning. And I, I know that um, with the Supreme Court ruling, with Citizens United uh, Supreme Court ruling, that it would require a constitutional amendment to make certain that we did something about um, the amount of money that's involved in politics, but you are absolutely correct. It makes candidates lazy. It enables um, third parties to be engaged in a secret uh, way without any kind of accountability. It makes it mean, angry, bitter, um, because there are shots being taken of virtually everybody every day. The candidates, by the time it's over, regardless of whether or not they win or lose, are both tarnished and corroded by all of this third party advertising. Yep. And as a consequence, we end up with a system that nobody has confidence in because it has the living daylights beat out of it day after day. Yeah. I also think you're absolutely correct about the involvement of the internet. And uh, when I was a child even, and, um, and I'm certain when you were as well, I remember the most respected man in America was Walter Cronkite, <clears throat> PBS news anchor. Yeah. And that, during that period of time, as you mentioned, the federal airways um, being utilized for communications justified the ability for there to be regulation. Yep. And it had to be, um, it had to be equal time for any opinions that were right. rendered. Right. And it had to be fair and balanced. And if it wasn't, then the, um, the Federal Communications um, Administration could intercede. And that provided the kind of check and balance that you mentioned earlier. That rule has never been repealed, I found out. Like you, I've been studying what kind of institutional changes can one make in order to bring some balance back into the political system, make it more factually centered, more fair than what it has been, enable candidates, regardless of their financial means, uh, to be involved in, in campaigns. And that um, clearly is, is one of them, campaign finance, and returning some sense of decency, good, mens, good, good manners, and common sense to our public communications. And of course, the internet utilizes those same federal airways. Yeah. And as a consequence, I, I and Congress, as I'm sure you 
you know, has been considering the uh, Communications and Decency Act, talking about removing the immunity that's been provided to all of these different bloggers and cable companies and internet companies that are uh, spewing out all of this information from political hucksters who are more interested in clicks and shares and retweets than they are anything else, because at the end of the day, that's what pays their salary, millions and millions of dollars in salaries. I know. So there are some concrete things that we can do, and I agree with you completely. Those are, those are a couple of things that can be done. Another thing that I was uh, talking with um, one of your aides about was an open primary system. You know, the, uh, the committees, and frankly, having been engaged in that on the inside of the beast for a period of time, prior to the time that it got um, so bitter and angry, um, nonetheless realizing that committees and parties have substantial influence on determining which candidates get involved at what point in time in what races, that um, it doesn't make sense that we have partisan primaries where you, at least in Montana, and I think in a majority of states, you have to pick which party you're going to, which ballots you're going to vote in, right. the, in the primary. And when really it ought to be a matter of your choice. And states that have actually set about to focus upon that question have overwhelmingly had those laws approved by the people in those states. Um, so... That's something that I would like to see replicated across the country. So the majority of voters can make selections of candidates and diminish somewhat the ability for the parties to control the primary election process. Yeah, we tried to do this in Arkansas and um, this year, and uh, but we failed. You know why? Um, because the parties didn't want it. Yes. You know, we, 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 we say political parties are good because they articulate the issues. They do control things. and. Uh, and what we've moved in the direction of in the last hundred years in this country is more direct democracy. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, when we brought the internet out, we thought, boy, this is the best in direct direct, but, but what we did is we, if you go back to the constitutional convention and there's that famous saying about Ben Franklin, he leaves the, and, and, and the woman says, Mr. Franklin, Mr. Franklin, what do we have? What's happening? He says, ma'am, you've got a republic if you can keep it. And we believe that you would elect representatives to make these decisions rather than direct democracy. The only direct democracy were New England town hall meetings when we started. And now, you know, we're more and more moving to direct democracy. I and hope it, I hope it keeps going. Have, well, <laughs> I mean, I believe in it, but if you don't have an informed citizenry that pays close attention yeah. to it, one, one of the things that I was talking to uh, people in Colorado about was gun control. Now, in Colorado, 70% of the people believe in gun control. They would like to see assault weapons off the streets and stuff like this, but it never gets passed because the 30% of the people or 22% 22, 22 of the people who want to liberalize gun control and they want the right to carry openly without permits and so forth, um, they're one issue voters. So it's not about the number of people, it's the intensity of the demand. So um, my dad was a lifetime member of the National Rifle Association. And he always said, he said, kid, first they're gonna register our weapons and then they're gonna take them up from us, just like they did the Nazis in the Nazi Germany. And you know, that was always the, the theme of the NRA. I'm not an NRA member. Um, I got 20 guns at home or more, but, and I do shoot and hunt, but um, I think when you look at these kinds of specific polarizing issues, it's about the intensity as well as the number of voters, and it's one of the flaws of direct democracy. And so I, you know, I, I don't know, I, you know, Governor, I think we're going to see this come together, though, this problem of the fractionation of America and foreign policy in the 2022 and 2024 elections. And Mr. Putin um, has tried really hard to influence the United States. And there is, um, on, on both sides of the political spectrum, there's been a lot of Russian influence. And um, it comes through money, 
and it comes through associations. And um, obviously, Mr. Trump was uh, enamored with, with, with Vladimir Putin, and he may be the candidate of the Republican Party in 2024. And President Biden is here with a war on his hands, and he's walking on eggshells as to exactly what he does. If Putin uses a nuclear weapon, is that the start of World War III? If Putin wins and de defeats Ukraine and takes over Ukraine, does that mean he's a loser or that Biden's a loser? Or is it as what President Trump said that Putin's a, he's a really smart guy. And so this combination of foreign policy and domestic policy is going to really, I think, erupt, maybe not so much in 2022, but certainly by 2024. I think it's just uh, going to fractionate the America. And I think that's what Mr. Putin's counting on. Could, well, um, excuse me, Governor, could, could I could I jump in? I, I apologize for the interruption. Not at all. But I, I know from our events here that we have typically an audience that are very curious and would be very happy if they could ask a few questions uh, in the time that we have remaining. So I, I apologize for that. But um, could I ask the audience, we're going to have a microphone right down here. Um, and I'd ask you if you have some questions for the general and the governor, um, please feel free to come up and uh, ask them at the microphone. I'm just gonna ask three very simple things of you. Um, one, I think in keeping with our event um, that we keep things civil and respectful, and that's typically really easy for, for Montanans. Um, the second is to keep it on point. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about civil dialogue um, in politics and in foreign policy. And the third is um, a, a question typically ends in a question mark. It's, a, it's an interrogative of some sort. So um, wh while your comments are interesting, and no doubt that there are a lot of people who like to ask a lot of questions. So I'd be grateful if you could you know, bring your question right to the point, please, rather than a, 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 a lengthy preamble. Um, so the, the microphone is open here. While, while we're waiting for people to come up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my prerogative to launch a first question. General, you, you were just talking about Russia and Ukraine. And if I can just kind of launch from there, it, it's interesting that there is has been some bipartisan support in Washington regarding some, some activities in support of the Ukraine. But if you kind of just brush the surface of that and you get into the other issues like uh, NATO, like the US relationship with Europe, like um, an emergent China, you immediately um, enter into a, a rather acrimonious debate once again. Um, so I wonder if, if you and the governor might just say a few words uh, more specifically on where does this issue of civility in our debate fall when it comes to foreign policy? How can we, how can we best engage? How can we best ask our political leaders to engage in a civil dialogue? And then finally, you know, to help us understand why does that matter? Why does it matter that we have that in our foreign policy? Well, let's start at the back. Why does foreign policy matter? Um, I think, you know, that was a pretty good question to ask. I got out of the military in 2000. I was making my first public speech um, out in a resort in the West Coast. And um, as I was talking about NATO and 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 and, and foreign policy, there was a smart young guy in the back talking to my wife, and he said, why is General Clark talking about foreign policy to us? I mean, we're businessmen, and, uh, and, and with the foreign policy, that's his problem. Why do we need to know about it? And um, a few months later, we had 9-11, and that's why we need to know about foreign policy, because these events have tremendous impact on us. Now, I did a lot of work with uh, corn farmers for years out in the Dakotas. And of course they had to sell their dried distillers grain to China. So for them, foreign policy was about how do we sell dried distillers grain, which is what's left over after you've taken the starch out of the ethanol. How do we sell that to China? Or how do we sell ethanol to Mexico? And so there's a million different economic issues that are connected to foreign policy. But ultimately, um, it's, we take for granted the role of the United States in the world and the US dollar. 
And the economists will tell you that the US dollar, I mean, it, it, it's called fiat currency. Fiat from the Latin word of, they say it's worth a dollar, you know? And, um, and so when you look at it, I mean, it's just a piece of paper. It's not worth anything except that you and I believe it. And so does the world and they accept it. And so there's a big attack right now on the dollar internationally. If that dollar goes, it means the United States can't borrow money the way that we do. It means the economy will contract. It means that we won't be able to punish our enemies by putting sanctions on through the Federal Reserve banking system. So there's a huge economic impact on foreign policy that just goes unstated in this country. So much depends on it. But as for how we form it, it has to be bipartisan. It just has to be. It has to come out of the Congress, the polling of the American people, the statutory obligations, treaty obligations we've undertaken, and common sense and character of the people in leadership. And um, it's always a really tricky line to walk because you get criticized if you're in political office in the executive branch for the foreign policy by the elected representatives in the Congress. They can criticize, but they don't have the responsibility. And so I can tell you that right now, this White House is very concerned. They can't allow Putin to win in Ukraine, but they cannot escalate American engagement to the extent that Putin is triggered into either mobilizing Russia to war or using a nuclear weapon or attacking NATO. And they can't do it because um, they know that it might not be successful, but also because they've got to worry about the support of the American people. You know, in 1940, on the eve of World War II, the Congress passed the Selective Service Act, which reinstituted the draft by one vote. Roosevelt stood by as Britain was bombed night after night after night in the blitz of 1940 by the Nazi bombers. He watched London burn, and we could do nothing directly. We signed Lynn Lease, we gave him some obsolete destroyers, we convoyed some stuff back across, back and forth across the Atlantic, but it took the attack on Pearl Harbor to mobilize the American people to do something. So I can tell you the White House is acutely aware of what the limits are in foreign policy today. That, did I scratch the itch on that a little bit? I think comprehensively. Um, you, you clearly know the issue is, uh, better than anybody in this room, I would suspect. <clears throat> from, from my perspective, um, when I think about it, with how humanity has evolved, with the number of citizens on the planet, um, we are, or the number of people on the planet, not necessarily all citizens, we are inextricably interwoven one with another. And we simply, um, if there ever was a moment where isolationism was possible, it is uh, completely impossible at this moment in time as the uh, world has evolved. You know, I'm struck by, <clears throat> when I take a look at how Congress has reacted, how the American people have reacted, how the world has reacted. And of course, no one could know NATO better than you do. Um, but I did a little bit of study trying to make certain I understood precisely what it was that you had to do when you were in command. And um, obviously it wasn't easy and when you saw the progress that had been made, you know, it was a Republican that really advanced um, membership in NATO for the United States of America. And um, he was an isolationist until after the um, Second World War. Right. right. Uh, and then was the chief architect with Harry Truman yeah. and ultimately designing uh, NATO. And then, of course, um, even while it was being debated, there were countries being encircled by the Soviets and brought in um, on the other side of the Iron yep. Curtain that they established. Yep. 
and now there are 30, which you um, yeah. contributed to greatly. So I think that there's a balance there between believing we can establish democracies any place and providing incentives to make certain that as many taste democracy as possible on the face of the earth. And at the end of the day, um, we simply can't avoid that responsibility. And really it's the same, I think, the same moving parts that come with how we do things, need to do things in America. And if we look to those founders, even though they were so strong-willed, had their own thoughts, they came with their preconceived notions, they didn't want anything beyond Articles of Confederation, but at the end of the day, realizing the necessity and their freedom depended upon unity, yeah. they ultimately compromised and came out in and virtually all of the people that were there signed the document. Yeah. And then it only took 10 months uh, for it to be ratified by the states. So it's possible. And I've, I've actually seen with the reaction of Congress to the Ukraine situation, a um, huge amount of consensus, very few objectors. Right. It always has made me wonder why we have to have such extraordinary tragedy to bring out the best in people. But I think we have to work as they did when they drafted the document to begin with, through a matter of self-discipline, reminders of how valuable character is. Uh, of course, I know in your military life, it was an everyday remembrance because that really was the code that you lived by. Oh, that's true. And I think it was in neighborhoods across this country at one point in time. Um, we need to reinstill that, work at it as citizens. I, I don't know that you can command it, but I think we can certainly exhort our friends and neighbors and each other and show it by example, change the institutions that we can change. I think there's a lot of them that even need to change in Congress. I, they don't spend any time at all with each other back there, unless it's waiting their turn on C-SPAN or some other um, commentary show that is uh, alleged to be news, but amounts to hucksterism mainly. Um, so the, the coinage, the currency that I think you're correct started when, when Newt Gingrich and the gang came to town and for the first time in 40 years were involved in managing the affairs. I mean, they came to make their point and they made their point too well. And I think even many of them now regret that the, um, the method of exchange, the method of, of deliberation had not changed so drastically as it has. Yeah, I think it's become really hard part. I mean, there's a lot of things in the Congress that make it harder, you know, like the constant television that's on and the fact that people get home on the weekends and they don't hang around and socialize with each other and get to know each other. Um, they got rid of earmarks, but it, but they're back now for the first time. And uh, so people can put in requests for their own congressional districts, things like that. But, you know, talking about the consensus in Congress on on foreign policy, um, and I'm I can't see whether there's anybody waiting. There's a question right here, so I better take that question. Hi, okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say it's really a big honor to get a chance to address both of you. Um, and my question's a little bit more personal, philosophical, as opposed to political, but um, you know, we're talking about these huge issues like partisanship that's made worse by a dysregulated internet and like the potential of an impending world war. And I was just wondering how two gentlemen such as yourselves that have had such long and successful careers in politics um, kind of work against the feelings of fear, apathy, hopelessness, because um, I know that, that that affects me pretty deeply and I, I would love to have a big career in politics, but it's really heavy right now. I was just wondering if you guys have any tips or advice for myself or the American public in general, um, how to kind of continue fighting the good fight, I guess. No, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't quite hear you. Look, oh, no. <laughs> I wanna say my ears are really bad mm -hmm. from too much artillery and tank <laughs> gunfire, but the acoustics in here, I know the audience can hear the question, but I couldn't hear it very I, well. I couldn't hear it very well either, I'm can, sorry. Can, 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 can we? Let me just walk over. Tell us the question. Hi, yeah. I was just wondering, talking about these big issues like, like partisanship, worse by the internet and the impending threat of a potential. Um, and I know you guys have long and thoughts or advice you guys off here. 
um, here. This is right now for the American. It's a very good question. Okay. Yeah, I understand the question. Okay, well, I'll start. Look, the question is, you know, the internet's all about emotion. It's not about facts. That's the problem. And the facts that are on there, they're not checked and, uh, and they're, they're thrown out in ways to generate fear or anxiety or, or hatred. And the question is, you know, what can we do to improve the dialogue on the internet? And um, I just think it's a, it's a really tough question. Now, Elon Musk has just bought Twitter and he said he wants more freedom of speech on Twitter. But if, if there's no code of, of conduct, if people aren't given some rules of the road about how to address each other, then, then you know, we just have chaos and anger boiling up. And that's not good for us. So I, I don't know. I think you're going to just have to have uh, enough people in positions of authority who are outraged by the anger. And as the governor said, it's hard because in politics, that money drives everything. You can't get elected without the money. You can't get the TV ads. You can't get the consultants. You can't put your program out there. You've got to have a bio film on you. Somebody's got to write it and produce it. It's got to have music behind it. You, I mean, you've got to have advanced people to build a crowd. I, I went through all that. And um, you can't do it without money. And so you've got to be careful because it's the passion that drives politics. It's sort of an inherent contradiction. It's like the flaw at the center of democracy. You know, you always picture it as, well, these people are going to sit here like uh, the governor and the general on the stage are going to have this very fact-based, very non-emotional conversation and go out and have some have a beer together and say, this is really nice. Yeah, but when your entire career is resting on getting a certain law passed or helping a certain constituent. When I got back to Arkansas, a friend of mine said, said, Wes, you don't want to be a senator. I said, I don't. I mean, some, you know, when you come back and you're in a little state like Arkansas, people know you and I grew up there and everything and, you know, People said, you should run for office. You should, you know, we, you know. And the guy said, you don't want to be a senator. I said, but I don't. But, but, but why would that be? He said, you'll find out. You know, when you're in the army, a senator's next to God. He, when they come in, they inspect a base and you fly them around. You say, yes, sir. And I mean, like John McCain, uh, you know, we worship John McCain. He was fantastic. And so are all the senators. But what what I found out was, at least in, in my state is, you know, a senator is a servant of the people. And it's not just any people, it's the people who put the money behind the campaigns. And so just like here in Montana, you had a law at one point, I think that based on, uh, was it Anaconda Copper? That was, you, you, <laughs> you, they weren't allowed to contribute to politics because when they did, they dominated everything. They, they control the whole state just by the money. And um, in Arkansas, we've got four or five big businesses, really nice people run them and everything, but that's, that, that's the state. So it's really hard to get a group of influential leaders who will say, let's put out a code of behavior on the internet and let's appoint a neutral group and let's take a vote on it. Let's do crowdsourcing voting on what's the limit of communication. Can you call someone a liar? You liar! Or, or uh, in my, it says I-M-H-O. I-M-H-O, you're a liar, in my humble opinion. And that kind of stuff, I mean, or is it wrong? Or do you have to do the facts? I don't know how we're gonna do it. Well, I sense from your question, and actually hearing it um, when you were up close, but you're obviously genuinely and seriously concerned about the future of the country and about the future of your family. And having five children and nine grandchildren, I have that same concern, but I can tell you, they have the same concern you do. And I've had the chance to 
make some arguments and presentations and take part in some listening sessions with young men and women in college and in high school and in a variety of other settings. And my steadfast belief is that there actually is a huge number of people out there who share your concerns and mine and the generals. And tapping into that, of course, is very difficult, especially when there's so much noise. And frankly, I think it's entirely possible for us to do something about campaign finance reform. We'd have to amend the Constitution to do it. But there's a bill introduced in every session of Congress, and it never goes anyplace. Part of the reason it never goes anyplace is because we don't demand it, each one of us as individuals. And I, let me tell you a little story. I decided that because I have been frightful, virtually um, fearful of what it is that's taking place with our, in our country. And it was something so remarkably different than anything that I was involved in in 30 years of politics. I mean, we made mistakes. We stumbled around. I'm sure we were inefficient. But the thing I craved more than anything was the trust of the people that I wanted to serve. And they knew that we were human, that we would make mistakes. And there was a presumption of innocence that they accorded us until we made so many mistakes that we were no longer worthy of their trust. And that all started to change in about 2006. I was working in Washington, D.C. at the time. I could feel it. And the campaign techniques were changing. There was more money that was involved. The, um, the United States Supreme Court had decided this, this uh, funding case. Um, the internet was advancing. And now we have some of the preliminary results, some of the test results from all of this. And it's a mess, an absolute mess. So we can change things if we somehow can empower a majority through our exhortations and encouragement and enough numbers for them to do something about it. I mean, the money involved is obscene and it makes candidates lazy. I can tell you, I was a candidate six times and asking for financing is not easy, but you have to do it. And I did it on an individual basis or at a community fundraiser, where I saw the people I wanted to represent. There was no internet, there was no internet financing. I mean, raising a million dollars overnight in $5 contributions is absolutely mind boggling to me. And so we have to do something about that and changing who can make contributions. These third party dark groups should have no business involved in electing people to public office. And if we have to pass a constitutional amendment to make that happen, then so be it. Let's get it done. Second thing is, as the general and I were talking earlier about standards and controls by the Federal Communications Commission are entirely appropriate. I mean, it's not just campaigns that are being influenced. Look at your kids. I mean, they spend hardly any time with each other. They're always on a screen of some kind or another. There's 360,000 tweets a second that are being dispatched every single minute of every single hour of every single day of every single year. And as they move around the, the planet at warp speed, nobody knows what's going on because there's so much noise. They don't have enough time if they're gonna make sure they take care of their kids, they uh, work at their job, they take care of their spouse. There's not much time left for anything else to try and discern. I mean, I spend hours looking at information because I'm now um, what they call a senior citizen and retired. <clears throat> so I'm so concerned about this. I read about it constantly and I try to find different sources of information that give me different perspectives. And I've found some that I think are reliable and that I can test one against the other. At the end of the day, there's some things we can do institutionally as the general mentioned. Fairness doctrine, campaign finance reform, open primaries, but really at the end of the day, it's on us. And, um, and I, I'm telling you plainly, when I first started shooting off my mouth, and I'll be quiet in just a minute, um, I was surprised at the reaction. I thought I was going to get a lot of pushback. And I have to tell you, I've gotten none. 
I've gotten one angry letter to the editor. They didn't even send it to me directly. Now, I'm sure there are a lot of people mad at me, but I really don't care because the issue is that serious and that challenging and that urgent. And at the end of the day, you know, when you look around, you see people who are pursuing power just for the sake of power. And frankly, it's an elusive dream. You never get it anyway. You never have it. And if you have to use it, you don't have it. So we, I think um, with enough of citizen involvement, and I honestly believe there are enough of us out there, both Democrats and Republicans, um, to fix this whole thing. And I, I think you're seeing some changes that are starting to occur. All of you are here tonight, um, and you, you have the ability to influence some friends, neighbors, children. Uh, I mean, I argue with my own children about this over how much time we're going to spend on those damn screens. And so fight the fight and, and, and get involved. It's not hopeless, not even remotely close to hopeless. Let's see how this works. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm a political scientist, taught at MSU for 30 years and also wrote a book on the former Yugoslavia after going there five times beginning in May, June of 1995. So during the war. Um, and I served in the legislature for eight years. So from my Bosnian experience, I wanted to know what I could apply to my lived political elected office experience. And I concluded two things I wanna hear you comment about. One is democracy is hard. And the other is that polarization has a lot of emotional appeal to both sides. I know as a Democrat, I always benefited from having good, thoughtful debates. It showed the weaknesses in my arguments and it strengthened some of them to carry me through. But today it seems like, and it can happen on both sides, we have a religious takeover or influence on the Republican Party. It's making it very difficult to return to civil and respectful democratic dialogue. So that's the first thing I'd like to hear you talk about. The other is that we have terrorism and climate change and zoonotic pandemics and shared you know, threats to our collective existence as human beings. These are existential threats. We need a narrative that can make invoke in us the awareness of our shared destinies. How do you do that? Well, I don't blame you for your perception. Um, and not just your perception, maybe your reality, um, as you describe it. The, um, at, at the end of the day, I think that, um, that there may be some of those elements. Now, I, I'm unaware of precisely how they may be engaged, but you have enough of legislative experience to know, at least I hope you have the same experience I had. Well, maybe I should describe my own. Um, sitting in legislative hearings, listening to testimony being presented by our fellow um, citizens and inhabitants in Montana, trying to distill something into policy, um, finding out that you can give a little bit and maybe they can give a little bit and getting, frankly, everything that you can possibly do to get everybody to a good place without compromising their principles and do something that benefits the people you jointly serve. Did you have that experience when you were in the legislature? Well, I did, and I used to organize the dinner for first termers on both sides of the aisle and have us all go out to dinner and just learn about each other's personal lives. But I'm looking at particularly the most recent Supreme Court, the leak of the Supreme Court's decision on overturning Roe. 70% of American people don't believe it should be overturned. And I attribute that to the influence of the religious right, frankly. Well, there are some incendiary issues like that, as we all know, that actually require more civility, more listening, more genuine commitment to think about and to hear different points of view before policymakers ever make a decision. I think that's what ought to take place always. But there are some issues that have a heightened and a very much larger degree of difficulty associated with them. And that clearly is one of them. Do we all know everything we need to know before we make a decision or do we make up our mind 
uh, before we ever get to a point of arguing or listening or, or hearing what it is or the moving factors to make a decision on the sound basis. I think, frankly, with the internet and, and our inclination as human beings is to be precipitous and to jump to conclusions and then look for the reasoning to justify what it is that we think is right. And we want to control the decision. So we're talking about something here under a microscope that is incredibly difficult and challenging for citizens, no matter which side of the issue they're on, I think. There are other issues like it. Race is another one of those incendiary and very challenging issues. Um, going down the scale of degree of difficulty, climate change would be another that um, I think is perplexing and difficult. Weapons at some point for some people would be one of those decisions. And what do we do when we get to that point? But scream and yell and carry on and be uh, precipitous in our judgments. And I think, frankly, we need to go back to the very techniques that were utilized. And if you brief people from both parties, you know this is a matter of instinct, trying to get them into a place where they will objectively consider the facts and make a decision based upon the best interest of all of the people involved. Now, it's so easy to say, and so difficult to accomplish, I understand. But I don't think it's impossible. And I don't know what's going to happen, obviously, uh, with the Supreme Court case. I don't know what's gonna happen with all of the issues surrounding critical race theory. But I believe at the end of the day, we solve these problems the same way that the founders solved their problems, uh, through thoughtful discussion, through presentation of ideas, through trying to make certain they considered other people's thoughts uh, clearly and, and fairly, presuming the innocence and the good faith of those that you're arguing with or, or, or discussing something with, I still think those are the, are the, the only ways that we ultimately get to um, good decision-making. Screaming, yelling, buying advertisements, I don't think does it. At the end of the day, again, it's on us to um, make certain we're engaged and, and talking and trying to make certain people have uh, or will take a fair opportunity to consider very, very difficult issues. I don't have um, a magic solution, however, and I know some of my suggestions may appear to sound naive, but at the end of the day, that hasn't been my experience. I've been to hearings over and over and over again involving very, very difficult issues with um, you know, tribal governments, water rights, all those kinds of things that would appear to be incendiary and hard and at the end of the night, after four or 500 people are in a room listening to the testimony back and forth, they were able to make a decision that ultimately both sides could endorse. I still think that's possible. Very I general. think we've got to have leadership at the party level that sets the rules of behavior. And it starts with the, um, when people are elected to office, they need to go through a little grooming period. In the army, when you make one star general, they call it charm school. And they bring you up to Washington for a week and they <clears throat> and they tell you things. They say, like, okay, you all, you know, we picked 50 generals, and uh if you were all on a plane and it crashed and we had to pick 50 more, there wouldn't be any difference, really. Said now, now that you're a general, of course, you're gonna be a lot more handsome and a lot better looking and a lot more attractive and you know it's not true. And so watch your personal conduct. And they tell you these things. And we need to be doing this and holding our legislative branch as well as the executive branch to standards. There's a, there's a White House ethics office, it's pretty good. The Supreme Court has no ethics standards. And that's one of the things that's really hurting us right now in this country. And that's up to John Roberts. If he can't lead the Supreme Court, then if you believe in democracy, something's gonna to happen to the Supreme Court because it's losing legitimacy. And in the Congress, if you have people who are firebrands and they do it to get publicity, you need to find a way to give them some adverse publicity as a result of it, not just favorable publicity by saying, he's really, or she's really standing up for whatever it is by you know calling the other side crazy. And it really comes down to leadership. George Washington was the logical person to become the president of the country. He'd, he, he had a tough time during the Revolutionary War. He lost a lot of battles. They kept telling him, don't attack. And he kept wanting to attack and he kept losing 
They said, don't defend New York. He tried to defend New York. He almost lost his army in New York. He got run out of New Jersey. Um, he sat down on Christmas Eve in 1776 and realized he was going to lose his army because they were all going to walk off in January when their enlistment was up. And he decided they would attack the British across the Delaware in Trenton. So he had stature and people listened to him. And even he couldn't prevent Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton from clashing in their political ambitions. And it ripped George Washington apart. So this is a, the hardest problem is the control of individual ambition in public office. It's a really tough problem. Ultimately, we have to do a better job of educating our populace. And that's why I'm so glad to see you all here tonight. And I hope you will demand that your elected representatives treat each other with respect and work for the common good. Now you're about to say we're I, gonna stop. I but have to butt in again. I, I, I hate to be the one to interrupt and, and butt in because uh, General and Governor, this is our 101st event this year. We've done in-person, online and hybrid events. And it's also the 101st event where there have been more questions than time. So I apologize to, to people who had questions to our distinguished guests, but um, I, I have to um, thank and apologize the staff here at the Emerson Theater um, who uh, have, have helped us and hosted us and who are staying um, overtime um, to, so, so that we could have a chance to really gain from you know, your length and breadth of your experience. Uh, so uh, you know, on behalf of my organization and I think on behalf of our participants, I wanna thank you very much for coming here tonight, sharing your experience and your views from a long and distinguished, two long and distinguished careers in public service and to continue your public service in forums like this. Could you join me in thanking the general and the governor? Thank you. No, Mark, it's really, really nice to be with you. We have friend. to do this again. Okay, can we do this again? I promise I won't talk as much next no, time. No, I, I was bad too. I was bad too. <laughs> Look, um, can, I know we're out of time. No, no please go ahead, General. I, I, I don't feel right leaving without explaining something about foreign policy that's near and dear to my heart. Now, you're the World Affairs Council. Correct. So talk about this. The United States has not had an effective policy strategy for how to get along in the world since 1991. When the Soviet Union fell apart, we lost our strategy. In the 1990s, we did a lot of peacekeeping and we expanded NATO. That was fine because these people begged us for protection, not because we were against Russia, but because they knew that Russia was gonna to try to take them over again. 9-11 happened, we invaded Iraq and Afghanistan. We went into Afghanistan without a plan to finish it. We went into Iraq without a plan to what to do with it. And there were actually people from the Pentagon telling me, you know, after we finish Iraq, we're gonna take out Syria and then we're gonna get uh, Libya, and then we're going to circle back around and we're going to get Iran. And it was this grand dream of, you know, all this military stuff. Of course, it didn't work. And then Obama came in and he said, I'm not going to do stupid stuff. So he told the Russians, you can take care of, of Europe if you want to do Nord Stream, that's fine. He said, we're going to look at Asia because that's the future. And we're, of course, interested in space. So he basically, he didn't say it exactly, but he basically opened the door to Vladimir Putin. And he opened the door to Germany's great rapprochement and deep engagement with Russia. This administration came into office riding the heels of the Trump administration and the, and the angst about China. And it looked like a you know, good thing, hey, the Republicans are against China. Well, uh, you know, yeah, China, we should be against China too. And um, so the president went to see Putin and he said, just be a good citizen, uh, you know, uh, let's get along in the world. 
But that's not Putin. Putin wants us out of Europe. He wants NATO shattered, and he wants to take back his countries in Eastern Europe. And what we have to understand, in my view as Americans, is if we're worried about managing China, and we don't want a war with China, we have to have Europe united with us. We're in the pole position. We've got NATO. And Putin played into our hands by attacking Ukraine. Even the Germans now say they have to be worried about Russia. So it's the golden opportunity for America to come back together in foreign policy with a real strategy, which is build democracy in Europe, build a strong Atlantic economic community, and then with the 500 million people in Europe and 350 million in America, you can deal with a China with one and a half billion. Still got Japan, Australia, and so forth. But Japan and Australia, they're no substitute for Europe. Now, that's, we've got to get back grounded with a real strategy if we're going to maintain freedom and democracy in the 21st century. Otherwise, we're like the fatted calf at the feast, and everybody's going to come in and take their piece out of the American market and buy our politicians and destroy the value of this great country. So there's a lot to worry about in the outside world. And as Americans, we have to understand that what we share together is much more powerful. The love for liberty, the respect for the law, the love and care of our communities and our families, it's much more powerful than the issues that divide us. And we just have to keep reminding ourselves that every day. We've got to hold this country together. Future of mankind depends on this country holding together. Thank you.